Now that you have a good understanding of the valuation methods, let's take a look at other characteristics of a common stock. When you buy a share of common stock, you receive voting rights. So as a common stockholders, you don't really engage in the day-to-day -day activities of the firm. But very big decisions, such as mergers and acquisitions and dissolution of the company, so these are life or death matters from the company's perspective, um, they require direct votes from the stockholders. However, for most of uh, the day-to-day -day activities, including huge investments um, and payment to the CEO and all those questions, they are uh, managed by the board of directors. So the way that a common stockholders can exercise control over the manage management of the firm is by electing the board of directors. So the board of directors has the ability to set compensation bonuses and also discipline uh, actions, including firing of the CEO. Um, unlike political voting, in uh, common stockholding uh, voting, you can allow something called a proxy vote. What that means is you can give your voting right to somebody else. Um, and this actually happens quite often. A lot of, um, in the, if you own a share of stock, uh, before the annual meeting, you may get a ballot from your, uh, from the board of directors asking you to give them your proxy, meaning that you allow the board of directors to vote on your behalf. Um, Another important characteristic is the concept of cumulative voting. Not all companies have cumulative voting. Some do and some don't. So that depends on the bylaw of the firm. With cumulative voting, it allows a, a, a shareholder to cast all his vote on a single candidate. So, for example, if there are two seats open on the board of directors and you own 100 shares of a company with Cumulative voting, you will receive 200 uh, votes, and you can with cumulative voting, you can cast the entire 200 vote to a single candidate. Uh, without cumulative voting, then you must vote. You you get one vote per candidate, um, so uh, or per seat open, not per candidate, per open seat. So with cumulative voting, what that allows um, minority stockholders to do is that they can. Um, they can pull all the votes they have and nominate one candidate to represent them on the board of directors. In addition to cumulative voting, companies sometimes can also have different classes of stocks. This is particularly popular among new technology firms such as Facebook, um, Google, Snapchat. Um, what this, the different classes of stock uh, represent is different voting rights. So a company can issue two classes of stock. So for example, class A stock will carry a voting right of one vote per share. A class C stock can carry 10 votes per share or 100 votes per share. So that allows the owner, the original founder of the firm, to have a more voting rights for the same number of shares that they own because their stock is considered a different class. So this calls into a lot of issues of corporate governance, and that is a very um, hot topic of debate today about whether or not CEOs are being overpaid, uh, whether or not the board directors are always acting in shareholders' best interest, um, and also what control uh, public stockholders have over the management of the firm. So these are, these are not problems that we can solve in, in one day or one lecture. However, this is an important question to ask um, and to be aware of as you are investors, as you have become investors, or, and, and also as you work for a company. Other rights that um, a shareholder has include the rights to um, be paid dividend if a dividend is declared, uh, also the right to receive uh, re any remaining value in case the company goes bankrupt and declares a liquidation. Uh, more importantly, a lot of times companies have preemptive rights which give existing shareholders the first right of refusal. So this is, uh, they give them the option but not the obligation to buy um, stocks of the company if new stocks are being offered by the company. The idea is that they allow the, um, they allow the current existing holders to maintain their ownership control and also um, the ability to participate in future dividend payments. Um, dividends are 
an important part of the cash flow that returned to shareholders. So it's worth look, uh, understand um, more about what are the important characteristics. So dividends, an important, very important feature of dividend is that they are not a liability. So a company, when you buy shares of stocks, a company can go for a long, long time without paying dividend. Apple was one of the examples. It, it took uh, Apple many, many years before it started paying dividend. Uh, however, once a dividend is declared by the board of directors, then it becomes a liability. So a company, once, it, once the board of directors declare dividend, then the firm is obliged to pay it. Um, shareholders cannot force a firm to pay dividends. So a firm cannot be, go, cannot be forced into bankruptcy if they simply by not paying dividend back. Uh, the most important uh, controversy about dividend is tax. Um, you may heard of the complaint that business is double tax, they have tax twice. Um, the reason for that is because dividend payment is not considered expense. It's not considered expense because it's not that it's not a liability. If a dividend is an option, if firm can choose to pay dividend, it can choose not to pay dividend. So therefore they are not tax deductible. So what that means is income to the corporation is first tax at the corporate level. So the company has to pay tax on its income. And then when dividend is received by the shareholders, they are taxed once again as ordinary income. So it's called double taxation. Now, because of that, if a company owns a share of stocks in another company, you can have the same dollar income taxed multiple times. So an example uh, would be a company that's owned as a subsidiary. So, um, and if each company is its own corporation, the income can be taxed multiple times. And therefore, corporation has an exclusion, meaning, uh, meaning that 70% of the dividend income is not subject to tax. Another type of stock is preferred stock. Um, preferred stock is actually um, an interesting type of security. It's not exactly a bond and it's not exactly a stock. So for preferred stock, um, it's called preferred. The name preferred comes from the fact that the dividend for preferred stockholders will get paid. Uh, it must be paid before dividends can be paid to common stockholders. So that's, that's why they're called preferred. They got preferential treatment when it comes to dividend payment. However, because it's a stock, it's still not a liability of the firm, and they can be they can be deferred if a company doesn't have cash. Um, on the other hand, it has a lot of um, bond characteristics because div preferred dividends are usually fixed. So, uh, if you're doing homework for preferred stock, um, the a lot of times you the amount of preferred dividend is based on the par value of a preferred stock. So oftentimes a preferred stock will have a par value of $100. And then the dividend is expressed as a percentage. So if this is a 4% preferred stock, then the dividend will be 4% of $100. In other words, it will be $4. So in that regard, a preferred stock is a lot like a bond. However, since there's no ending date to a preferred stock, that $4 dividend will last forever. So preferred stock is a perpetuity, it's a constant dividend. Um, however, even though dividend is not a liability, preferred stock oftentimes is, a, is cumulative, meaning that if, you, if a company missed payment on the preferred dividend, they have to make up and pay all the back dividend before any common stock dividend can be paid. Um, another important characteristic about preferred stock is that it typically doesn't carry any voting right. You may have exceptions. The exception is if you fail to pay dividend for X number of years, then preferred stockholder may get to vote. And again, that uh, those, those clauses are included in order to protect preferred stockholders. Lastly, we're going to take a look at the stock market. So how this stock market is where stocks are traded. Um, there are two main types of market. Now, uh, some markets are organized as dealers market and some markets are organized as brokers market. So dealer, um, the easiest way to think of dealer market versus broker market is think about car dealers versus a real estate broker. 
So in a car dealer, the car dealer will buy this car. So for example, if you, you buy a new car, you will take your old car to the car dealer, you sell your old car to the car dealer, and then you buy another car from the car dealer. So the most important thing, characteristic of a dealer is that they maintain ownership of the asset. So the same thing for stocks. If you go to a dealer, you sell your stock to the dealer or you buy your stock from the dealer. So in the meantime, the dealer uh, owns the stock as inventory that they can buy and sell out of. So if their price change while the dealer is holding onto the stock, the dealer takes some risk. Um, so just imagine a dealer um, on, on a car that has been recalled and all of a sudden nobody wants to buy that car. The dealer suffer most of the losses. Um, in the case of a broker, it's different. Think of a real estate broker. When a, the primary job of the broker is to bring the seller and the buyers together. So the real estate broker never buys the house. You don't sell a house to a real estate broker. The broker finds a buyer and um, and matches the buyer and the seller and the transaction occurred directly between the two. So the same thing occurs in the broker's, in the broker's market. There's uh, some of these uh, uh, stock markets are world famous, such as the New York Stock Exchange. Interestingly, the New York Stock Exchange is a broker's market and uh, the New York Stock Exchange has members and what you need to know is who those members are, um, how does the market operate, so all these are well described in the book. Um, so reading to you doesn't isn't very helpful. So I want to just highlight what you need to know, uh, how the New York Stock Exchange operate, uh, what are the four activities. And a major competitor to the New York Stock Exchange is NASDAQ. Uh, NASDAQ is a dealer market. So these are the big difference. So New York Stock Exchange is a broker market. NASDAQ is a dealer market. So NASDAQ doesn't have a physical uh, exchange, but rather is a network of computers. Um, both the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, um, most of the transactions are now done on computer networks. Um, but tradition follows. Um, NASDAQ tend to have more technology stock relative to the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, another thing that's very important to remember is that both NASDAQ and NYC, New York Stock Exchange, um, are for outstanding stocks. So these are what we call secondary markets. These are, these are markets where stockholders buy and sell from each other. So cash exchange hands in both the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ between stock, existing stockholders. The companies do not get cash through um, these markets. The market that a company raises money from is considered the primary market. So primary market is when new stocks are bought and sold. And the primary markets are all dealers market. Um, the importance of a secondary market is that they help establish the price of the stock and, and that is an important function of this market. This concludes the discussion on stock valuation and stock markets.